Joshua chapter 5. And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more, because of the children of Israel. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way, after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers, that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, whom he ways, raised up in their stead, then Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, they, that they abhorred in the places in the camp, till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and capped the Passover on the fourteenth day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow, after the Passover, unleavened cakes and porched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow, after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Amen. We'll get right into Joshua chapter 5 there. <clears throat> uh, verse 1 it reads, and you can uh, begin turning to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Verse 1 it reads, And it came to pass, when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more, because of the children of Israel. Of Israel. You'll notice right away that this is actually the exact opposite of what took place at the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 1, where if you read in verse 21, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And so at that time, way back, Israel sent spies to check out the land, and before he did so, he gave them a charge, saying, Fear not, neither be discouraged. You will not have to fear these people that you enter into their land, because I will fight for you, and again, ye shall hold your peace. If you look down in verse 26, the Bible says they didn't do what they were intended to do. In verse 26, notwithstanding, you would not go up but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. 
Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid. The Lord your God goeth before you. He shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. We can leave off there. The people of the land saw and realized the promise of God in verse 30, that the Lord your God goeth before you. He shall fight for you. And therefore, over in Joshua, as they entered into the promised land, finally, after that long hiatus due to their unbelief, the people saw Joshua's people and saw the people of Israel and saw God's people in great fear and in great discouragement. And the Bible says that their hearts melted. It's changed around here. God's people went forth in unbelief. And when they did so, their hearts failed and they were discouraged. God's people go forth in faith. And now the enemy is discouraged. The enemy's hearts melt. And we see that in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1. And so the lesson is clear. <laughs> go forward in faith. Whenever you are fearful, go forward in faith and allow that God would basically project any fear, any anxiety, any discomfort, any discouragement upon the opposition that you're facing. And you can just go confidently as long as you go in the hand of the living God. The Bible says that the enemies of the Lord here, those of the land of the Canaanites, the Amorites, and so on, had a melting heart, a great discouragement in their heart. No spirit left in them anymore for the fear and dread of God's people because they saw what God was doing in their lives. So we need to trust. We need to believe. We need to follow God and allow Him to confound and melt our enemies before us. Don't go in doubt. Don't go in fear. Don't turn back lest the fate of your enemies fall upon you. Be faithful, trust, believe, follow God in everything that you do. And don't be discouraged. Fear not, neither be thou afraid, is the charge to Joshua. Now, verse 2 gets into a topic, and I'm going to need to segue into this a little bit. I don't know we've ever discussed it in great detail before, but that's of circumcision. You read in verse 2 and 3, it says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives. And circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of their foreskins. I don't think we need to go into too much detail of what that entails or what that means. But we're going to look into a few of the spiritual aspects of that command to circumcise the hill of the foreskins of the people. Genesis chapter 19, sorry, 17. Genesis chapter 17 is where we'll begin and where the actual act of circumcision began. Genesis chapter 17, we find God here talking to Abraham. Abram at the time. Verse 1, or Genesis 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared unto him, appeared unto Abram. And said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And so here, Abraham is dealing with God at this ripe old age of 99. And God begins to say to him, the charge to walk before him introduces himself as the almighty God, though he knew him, of course. And he says, I will make my covenant with thee. And the first aspect of this covenant is that he will multiply his seed exceedingly. Verse 3, Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. So the first promise here that we see is that Abraham's seed would be multiplied. The second is that he would be a father of many nations. The third that we'll see play out in verse 5, it says, And neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, 
But thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant with, between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. So multiplied seed, father of many nations, a name change that is about to take place. Now we know these promises that are made to the seed, according to the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.16, are fulfilled in Christ. He says to Abraham and to thy seed were the promises made. And we say of seeds not of many, but of one. And thy seed which is Christ. That's Galatians 3.16. You can go there in your own time. And the next promise that was made was one of possession of a land. And so we continue down. In uh, verse 8, it says, All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And he would dwell there, I believe, as a stranger. There thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan will I give thee for an everlasting possession. They would go from stranger into inhabitant there, but we know that actually our stranger status essentially keeps on going. And it did so for Abraham, being that those promises were so far off for him. Continuing on in verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee, Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so God begins to show Abraham that there is a responsibility on his end in maintaining this covenant. God promises, Abraham essentially agrees and promises, and the responsibilities start to unwind and start to be showed to Abraham. The first being, every man child among you shall be circumcised. Verse 11, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a, look at this word, token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So verse 11, it says that this is a token. Verse 13, it says the covenant shall be in your flesh for that everlasting covenant. In other words, what you see here is that first and foremost, there's a conditional covenant taking place, isn't there? If they don't get circumcised, they've broken the covenant, and therefore they will be, as verse 14 says, cut off from the people because the covenant hath been broken. And so regarding the seed, regarding the father of nations, regarding perhaps this name change, especially the land possession, there is conditions to these promises being fulfilled on behalf of men, right? God's not going to break his side of the covenant, but men have to do certain things in order to maintain their side of the covenant. So it's conditional. Now, you'll also notice that it's referred to as a token and a mark in the flesh. As most symbols are, there's a temporal item and it actually, I believe, signifies a spiritual truth. It's kind of like a parable in this aspect. This token or this symbol, this outward change is to represent an inward change into the the man who has decided to go into the covenant okay so deuteronomy chapter 10 you can go there deuteronomy chapter 10 and we don't need to go too far into the bible before we see what god is referring to with respect to circumcision obviously there is that outward cutting there is the outward sign it's a token of the covenant that was made in deuteronomy chapter 10 and in verse 14, the Bible says this, Deuteronomy 10 and verse 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God. The earth also with all that is therein. So he's just establishing who's in charge here. Verse 15, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them. In other words, he, he had a delight and a desire to love the fathers, being Abraham, being uh, Abraham's uh, descendants, being those that were before Abraham. He reached out to a particular group because he loved them and chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Verse 16, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. 
and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. Verse 20, it says, Thou therefore, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and shalt thou, and him thou shalt serve, to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. So <clears throat> he says then in verse 16, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. That's very different than what we saw previous in Deuteronomy chapter 1, as well as in um, the, the account of Genesis chapter 17. But this is the spiritual truth that that physical symbol was to represent. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart, be no more stiff-necked. In other words, remove from your heart what is causing you to be stiff-necked. And instead, replace it with, what does verse 20 say? Fearing the Lord God, serving the Lord God, cleaving to the Lord God, swearing by His name. Something over your heart is hindering you from doing those things in verse 20. Fearing God, serving God, cleaving to Him and swearing by Him. Remove that. Circumcise that. Get rid of that so that you can love the Lord thy God in the fullness of of your heart as it's now released from whatever is causing you to be stiff-necked toward God. Now, just in a general sense, circumcision is a rite of passage, okay? So this is an identification or a sign of who you are or who you identify with, talking now specifically of the people Israel. It was to be an outward change. Of course, nobody, not everybody sees that, but it's an outward sign of an inward change. And in a lot of ways, it's similar to baptism. It's a sign, it's a token of the inward change. In the Old Testament, we have circumcision, which basically says that you are not going to be stiff-necked, that you've removed anything standing in the way of your heart being knit together with God and you intend to fear Him, serve Him, cleave to Him, swear by His name. You're joining in that covenant with God. In the New Testament, we look to baptism, which symbolizes Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, doing the same type of outward token to represent an inward change that has taken place. You're identifying with Christ as His child. You are showing a sign of who you are um, <clears throat> outwardly inside, okay? So regarding circumcision then, we'll focus in on circumcision. Exodus 12, it says that a stranger that intends to keep the Passover must be circumcised. So in order to be part of Israel, they could come, be circumcised, and then they could partake of the Passover. The Passover is another thing that as a child of Israel, you must partake in. It's so important that if you could not do it in this month because of some uncleanness, God gave an opportunity for you to do it one month later. We know it's important because the first Passover was life or death. Afterwards, they were a sign of remembrance to that first Passover that took place. Leviticus 12 gives clarity to the birth of a child. It talks about how long um, rest should take place for the mother, but then it says specifically about the man-child that the eighth day he ought to be circumcised or be cut off from his people. In other words, he won't have opportunity without that cutting, without that removal of the flesh taking place. That child has no opportunity to be identified with the people of God. No opportunity to, be, to, to show that sign of being identified with God as his child. You're removed from then the benefits of, you're removed from the festivals, Passover being specifically one of them. You're removed from identification with God's people as a result of the disobedience of not circumcising the child. This was the mark, this was the token, this was the sign of who you identify with in this world, pointing to the spiritual truth of what's taking place inside you. It's very important to the religion of the Hebrews, and you can turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. We'll get into the New Testament. Of course, we know it's important because now, again, the second time, they're bringing this to light as the people of Israel enter into the promised land. Circumcision takes place again. Now, unfortunately, as with many of these religious rites and expressions, the Old Testament 
Hebrews found great um, importance to it, and rightfully so. But Israel in the New Testament, and the Judaizers especially, who were practicing Jews of the religion of the Pharisees, and those that had that upbringing and maybe that bent in their consciousness, thought that they could take that Old Testament token and apply it to New Testament, and not only that, make it a necessity of salvation. These Judaizers always have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, and they thought to include circumcision as part of salvation, and therefore muddying up the simplicity which is in Christ. Acts chapter 15, look at verse 1. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So they've added to salvation, haven't they? They've added another step to God's perfect plan for the salvation of the soul. They've said, you got to be circumcised or you ain't saved. And that's a big problem because God here is starting to work in the world of the Gentiles where people aren't born having taken part in that practice. This practice of circumcision is very specifically associated with Abraham and his descendants afterwards and, and the people of Israel as a result and the law that God gave as a result. Continuing on in verse 5 here, it says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So these are believing of the Pharisees. They believe God, they're, they're trusting in his salvation, but they're getting now their gospel presentation all mixed up because they're saying, well, we got to make sure we get these people circumcised because I guess they had already done that. They figured they might as well put that upon everybody else. Verse 24 continues, and it says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And so now they're going to set the record straight. James stands up and he's about to make this, this letter as they have met together and discussed the issue. We gave no commandment. We got no word from God that says circumcision must carry on into the New Testament and is a salvation issue. Nothing. No such command. Nothing of that nature. And the Apostle Paul here is going to clarify if you go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Because he didn't take place necessarily um, in the decision that was made there by James. Though it was right. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2. Look with me in verse 25. It says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not the uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, it's natural, right? If it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision dost to transgress the law. Now watch this, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and that circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men. And the Apostle Paul here is simply highlighting that fact from Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16. The clarity that was given even in the Old Testament that says this is an outward token. This actually includes you as God's people and therefore you have access to um, you have access to uh, different different rites. You have access to the Passover. You can be of God's people if you, if you do this thing. But the Apostle Paul says, but bottom line is it's not removing that which is by nature that makes you a Jew. It's not an outward thing, but it's an inward change. The circumcision that takes place that is of God is one of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter. In other words, the one that removes the covering of your heart and allows God clear access to that. Being not stiff-necked. In other words, being believing is the circumcision. That's what's being discussed here. That is the true circumcision. And so the New Testament doctrine essentially is this. You cannot just cherry-pick. The Bible is clear that if you offend in one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. 
It's not like you can keep this law and that law and this law and somehow be more righteous standing before God. No, no, no. You're an offender of the law if you break it in one point. We know this to be true. That's why we take people to the verse about being a liar because lying is a sin that everybody takes part of, young and old, right? So if you're a liar, you're guilty and have offended all of the law, even though it's only one point specifically that you have broken. And of course, the truth is we've broken many, right? We're guilty of all the law, of course, even if you offend in one point. And so these were trying to just take, well, you know what? We like circumcision. Why? Because they'd done it. Why? Because they were born into that religion. Why? They didn't have to do anything to feel better than somebody else when it came to circumcision in particular. Paul gives in the New Testament the exact same conclusion as Deuteronomy chapter 10, which is circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men. In other words, it's not to benefit other men. It's not to glorify yourself in the eyes of men. The praise is of God because it's God that worketh in you to essentially remove a covering upon your heart, a spiritual covering. Now, is there benefit to circumcision Romans chapter 3 and verse 1 what advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision much every way chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God they had the word of God they had the instruction of God they had the law of God they had the ordinances of God that was committed unto the circumcision Therefore, they had a better opportunity to keep the laws of God because they would have known the laws of God. Somebody that's just completely ignorant of the scriptures and of the Lord and of his ways and of his manners and of his ordinance is not in a great position to believe after him. They're going to need to hear it from somebody else, come into the faith, and then finally they can have a hold of the scriptures and they can start to understand these things. But these of the circumcision, because that rite took place when they were born, you would assume that that would be carried forth. At least the instruction of that same circumcision and that same law would be to them from that day forward. They're in a great position to believe God. But that wasn't always the case, was it? We found that the Jews were actually heavy into unbelief and and always had um, the, the wrong perspective. The Jews always wanted to do that which was outwardly. And this is why the Apostle Paul is dealing with them in that. You are not a Jew just because you act like a Jew outwardly. Something inside you needs to change. There needs to be something removed in your flesh. There needs to be a piece of flesh removed from your heart in order that you can believe rightly and and follow God and seek after God rightly. They had the oracles. They had a better opportunity to believe by faith and obey God. Now, let's get some proof of this playing out from an Old Testament reference in the New Testament. Go to Romans chapter 4. In verse 9, Romans chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, Cometh then, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So that's a true statement. Faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? The answer, not in circumcision, but uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a sign of the righteousness of the faith, which had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Abraham believed God way before he was ever circumcised. He had that faith. He walked in these steps. He believed, received righteousness imputed unto him because of his faith and not because of the rite that took place when he was 99 years old being circumcised. That's clear. And so God here is basically just highlighting through the Apostle Paul that circumcision has nothing to do with your salvation. He's removing any shadow of a doubt. Why? Because faith 
belief, imputed righteousness happened to Abraham, who is the father of circumcision, honestly, should be the one example. If you need an example as to why circumcision should be part of your salvation, they should go to the one who circumcision was founded upon, shouldn't they? They go there and what do they find? He was saved long before that. He had believed long before that. He had trusted God and followed in those same steps that God had wanted him to go, walking in that faith, receiving imputed righteousness long before circumcision had taken place. So now the question is, what do we do in the New Testament with respect to circumcision? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If it has nothing to do with our salvation, what place does circumcision have here in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians, to the right of your Bible, in chapter 7, in verse 18. 1 Corinthians 7, in verse 18. Is any man called being circumcised? Okay, Called being that, that, that you've, you've come to know God. You've come to the saving knowledge. You, you've been called by Jesus. Let him not become uncircumcised. Okay, that's a little challenging. Is any called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. And that's what is usually preached more and was also preached by the, the Jews at the time when they, they the, or the, those that were of the Pharisees that tried to bring it to the Christian religion. They said, you've been called in uncircumcision, you have to be circumcised. But verse 19 just makes it clear. It says, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. So, what is he saying then here? If you're called in circumcision, don't become uncircumcised. If you're called uncircumcised, don't be circumcised. In other words, stay as you are, as you were, when you were saved, when you believed and received imputed righteousness. Now, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to say what you need to do. But I think that this also carries over to the birthing process. Because he says in 19... Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. This is a decision that parents will make for the child, of course. But I would say that what is of nature, according to the Bible, what is natural, perhaps it's just best to stay as you are. According to the scriptures, that makes sense. Of course, everybody do what's right in your own conscience in that respect when it comes to your own children. But I see that this then is nothing but a command of God, circumcision being that fell into the category of Old Testament law as a type of people being part of the nation of physical Israel. But now in spiritual Israel, if you're circumcised or uncircumcised, they're nothing. And so therefore you're, you're given leave to make the decision. And it's not going to affect your position in Christ one way or another. Verse 20, I think, makes it clearer. It says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So circumcision then was a token, was a sign of then a better circumcision. And what was that? Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5 and verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now, if you know anything about Galatians, in the book of Galatians, this church was full of Judaizers that probably had the exact same spirit of those in, in, uh, in the time when, when James stood forth and said, I gave no commandment that you need to be circumcised to be saved. Galatian church had a big problem with Judaizers, with people trying to bring the law into serving Christ. They tried to bring the law in as some sort of prerequisite or post-requisite for salvation even. Paul's constantly saying, who hath bewitched you? You heard the gospel very clear. You have the truth. Jesus Christ was evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now why have you muddied up the simplicity that was in Christ? And here he says there, stand fast in the liberty. It's Christ that hath made you free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 2, it says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. He's not saying that you can't come to Christ if you're circumcised. He's saying if you're trusting in that circumcision in any way, Christ will certainly profit you nothing when it comes to your internal redemption. Because it's all Christ or nothing. It's not Christ plus circumcision. It's not Christ plus baptism in the New Testament. Some people do that as well. It's Christ alone. 
which makes you free. And anything else, you're being entangled in the yoke of bondage. Verse 3, it says, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Not if you were born that way, of course, but those that are coming out to show in the flesh that I'm so spiritual because I got circumcised now that I've come to know the living God. And they, he, Paul says, well, then you're just a debtor to keep the whole law. Verse 4, it says, Christ is become no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. And that was the problem. It wasn't just about circumcision. They were trying to be justified by their own keeping of the law. He says, ye are fallen from grace. If that's your spirit, if that's your mentality. Verse 5, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And that couldn't be any more clear in the uh, story of Abraham. For in, verse 6, Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but, but faith which worketh by love. So he loved us, therefore we could give our faith unto him, and he does the saving, he does the setting of us free, he releases us from all bondage, he gives that to us freely by grace, righteousness being. So that then is the true circumcision that needs to take place. It needs to be that you have something in the way, it's removed, being your unbelief, you come to God, you come to Jesus, you believe on Him, He sets you free. Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 12. Galatians 6 and verse 12. Now, you'll find that people that are pushing this Judaizing movement, people that are pushing, add such and such and such to salvation, do this, or you before you're saved or you can't be saved keep doing this after you're saved or you can't stay saved they always have some ulterior motive whenever somebody comes and dangles something else next to jesus you know there's a problem here there's a deception afoot there's something taking place that you need to remove yourself from and just get away from there's simplicity in christ galatians chapter 6 and verse 12 shows this clearly it says as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So this is what he's saying here. There's a simplicity in the cross of Christ, and these don't want to receive of the persecution that comes with being united with Christ at the hands of the Jews, at the hands of the Judaizers. So he says, you've desired to make a fair show, a good look, a good work in the flesh by being circumcised, by falling trapped and snared by their by their constraining you of the same but it's not just circumcision it's not just that act of the flesh that they're after they want you to be circumcised they want you to keep a passover they want you to keep this law and that law and this it's never going to end with these guys and verse 13 shows their hypocrisy for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law <laughs> but they want you to make some outward show in the flesh in order that they could glory in your flesh it says, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And that's the circumcision that we need. That's the circumcision that God offers is a new creation in him. That's the better circumcision. That's not just some outward show and a, and a dedication of a child to submit themselves their whole lives into the law and following God and that type of thing and that type of religion. No, this is a new creature being birthed in a man because he has given God his faith. And we can go over to Colossians chapter 1 and it talks more about this new creature this new creature colossians chapter 1 and verse 11 colossians 1 and verse 11 that new creature the bible says is strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. That's that new creature. That's that, that circumcision that allows you to have a heart that's exposed to God, a heart that has what's hindering him removed so you don't be stiff-necked before him. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. What is that? In putting off the body of sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, rendering the old man to be dead, rendering that old flesh to be dead in order that you can be made anew, in order that you can be a new creature, part of that better circumcision, removing the body of these sins, of course, spiritually speaking, by that circumcision of Christ. That's the better circumcision that the other was just a type of, the other was just a symbol of. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. Remember, we're not teaching anything new. Deuteronomy chapter 10 made it clear that it was the circumcision of the heart that was what's important. It's not about the letter of the law. It's not about keeping commands. That's not what the point is. The point is revealing that there is an old man who's covered, who's veiled, who's fleshly, and then it's removed so that that heart can be exposed to God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, Where there is neither... Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So then the focus then is Christ, and he'll be the one that through his works gives you that new circumcision. What does he give you? A new man with a new everlasting life. He renews you in that, and you can go back and read through all of Colossians chapter 3 to find out more about what that true circumcision is. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Verse 5, this is pretty much the same thing as what it means to be circumcised. Mortify, cut off, get rid of, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. What are those members? Fornication uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Take a sharp knife and remove those things. Mortify them. Cut those members off. Put off, verse 8, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication from out of your mouth. Get your heart exposed. Get your heart clean before God. And God gives that to you. The bottom line is, are you in Christ? Is he in you? And when that takes place, you have that circumcision of the New Testament. Put on, therefore, as you put off the old. Put on Christ as you put off the flesh. Go to Joshua chapter 5 again. That was a big, long segue about circumcision. But that's why these things creep in. It's usually when they start bringing up, oh, you must be circumcised. Oh, you must do the Passover. Oh, you must keep the cedar. Oh, you must do the manure. They're always trying to drag you into some work salvation. They're trying to get you to make a show in the flesh. They're trying to constrain you and draw you away from the simplicity which is in Christ. Our bottom line is Christ in you. If he's in you, you are circumcised. You are new. You have had that part of your flesh removed. You have to render it so. In other words, every day you wake up, you have to put off these things. You have, to, you have to render yourself to be dead. You have to get rid of that flesh, walk in the spirit. You have to make a conscious choice every day, but you're empowered to do that. Joshua chapter 5, I think that's part of what takes place here, is that he's saying, hey, we're putting off our past. We're putting off what happened before. We're putting off the wilderness, and now we're going to enter into the land anew course they're going to do it with the actual circumcision taking place the one in their flesh verse 3 it says and joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of israel at the hill of their foreskins verse 4 and this is the cause why joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of egypt that were males even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of egypt now all the people that came out were circumcised But all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. Oh, in only one generation they had broken God's command with respect to this. And isn't he long-suffering? He's going to now command and allow for them to renew that covenant and to go and circumcise all the men, children again, bringing them all back together, getting them clean and ready to go on to the next step in the, the life of Israel. Verse 6, it says, For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. And when we think of that, we think of their murmurings, their disputings, we think of their lust. Just foundationally speaking, they weren't circumcising their children on the eighth day. The Bible says they had not circumcised those that came in 
out, those that were born in the wilderness as they walked forth out of Egypt. Unto whom the Lord swear that he would not show them the land, which the Lord swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that floweth with milk and honey. Verse 7, And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal, unto this day. In other words, all of the reproach of Egypt, all of the memories of Egypt, all of the all of the baggage from then has been rolled away. I love Joshua in the beginnings of this book. He just keeps basically setting everything right. Everything that they failed at, he does it right before the before the Lord. And just time and time again you see second chances from God being given to the people of Israel. And Joshua is making right decisions um, in leading Israel to have them do things right and have them set things right and have them repent of what they were doing and correct it and do right going forward. So here, circumcision is complete. Now if you look in verse 10, it says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the same self day. So check, Passover takes place. And it always astonishes me how the timing just works out. God's calendar, God's timing. He brought them to that point where they enter into the land. They're all circumcised. And then therefore they're given leave to actually take part in the Passover. Had they done it before the circumcision, they would have broke God's commands because it was necessary that even if you're a stranger and wanted to take part in the Passover, you must be circumcised before that takes place. Along with that circumcision, Passover, you find them for the first time eating of the fruit of the land. Verse 12, it says, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. And so there's another promise was that God said, When you enter into the promised land, You'll enter into houses that are furnished. You'll enter into cities and walls that are builded. You'll enter into land that was planted and it'll be ready there for you to reap. And they just experience that wonderful promise of God as they partake of the fruit of Canaan. And in the same day, God just takes away his man and stops providing for them in that way. From the uh, old into the new. They went from God providing man every day, which they had time and time again grow tiresome of to how now having that wonderful fresh fruit and fresh food off that land that they were promised now and this is a really interesting part of the chapter 5 of joshua it says in verse 13 it came to pass when joshua was by jericho that he lift up his eyes and looked and so again they just took part in the circumcision they just took part of the Passover. And now Joshua was out and he's standing by Jericho. Was he looking at the land to try to scope it out militarily wise and try to figure out how he's going to enter in? I think his head was down here at this time because the Bible says he lift up his eyes. Perhaps more than planning his attack, he was in prayer. Perhaps he was in meditation, as the Bible says in uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Maybe he was meditating upon God's command when he said, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Meditating on the word in prayer, just out there waiting to see what God would do if God would speak to him again. Because look at the manner of Joshua. He goes, he hears from God, he does what God says. He goes, he hears from God, he does what God says. And now he's out there, he's by himself, he's alone, his eyes are down. He lifts up his eyes, and the Bible says, And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. So he lifts up his eyes from the, the time of meditation or prayer perhaps, and he sees a man. 
The Bible says that this man is against him. In other words, turns toward him in, in a space between him. Maybe where Joshua was going to go somewhere, and now this, guy, this man is against him. Not only is he against him, there is a sword drawn in his hand. So Joshua immediately must think, perhaps this man is coming to fight. You don't have your sword drawn unless you're ready to go for battle. Usually it's away, unless you're sharpening or something. This man stands against him. The sword is drawn. But I love Joshua's response. The Bible says, And Joshua went unto him. So this man's standing against him, but Joshua doesn't hesitate to go unto him. And it says, And said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? I wonder if Joshua even drew his sword as he walked toward him and said, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Are you for us or are you for them? Now, the answer is always an interesting one. Verse 14, and he said, Nay. That wasn't a yes or no question, was it? Art thou for us or for our adversaries? I guess it could be yes or no, each part of it. And some people think that he's responding, the man here is responding to the second question. Art thou for us or for our adversaries? No. In other words, I'm not for your adversaries. But I think actually, it seems to me, what he's saying is neither. He's saying no to both of them. Are you for them? No. Are you for us? No. Why do I think that? He says no, but, in other words, contrary to what you just said, no, but as captain of the hosts of the Lord am I now come. Art thou for us? No. Are you for them? No, but I come as a captain. In other words, I'm for the Lord of hosts. I'm the captain of the Lord of hosts. I'm not with them. I'm not with you. A better question that should have been turned around and could have been turned around in this circumstance was, Joshua cries out, are you for us? The man says, no. Are you for adversaries? The captain says, no. And he could have said to Joshua, but are you for me? And that's the, an that's the question I believe that's being asked here. As the captain of the Lord of hosts am I now come. I'm not for you. I'm not for them. I'm not for these worldly squabbles. I'm for the Lord. Are you for the Lord? And I think Joshua is starting to show himself in that he crossed the river, in that he made the memorials, in that he circumcised the people, in that he kept the Passover. He's starting to show, yes, I'm for the Lord of hosts. I'm with the captain of the Lord of hosts. Never mind if he's with me or he's with us, I want to be with God. I want to be in God's plan. Joshua, I believe here, is relinquishing his control, relinquishing his authority, and being humble before the captain of the Lord of hosts. And the question can be asked to each one of us, are you for Jesus? You ask Jesus, are you for me or are you for my enemies? Are you working into my life or are you trying to benefit those that are attacking me? God, are you with me or are you with them? And Jesus just says, no. The better question is, are you with me? God asks, are you with Jesus? Are you in him? Are you of him? Are you with him? Are you by him? And I believe that this was Jesus, because look what happens in verse 14. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servants? And the captain of the Lord's host said. So he responds. Usually what happens if it's an angel, usually what happens if it's another messenger, if it's a, if it's a priest or if it's any man, if someone falls before them and, and on their face does worship, the first thing that a servant of the Lord would do would say, get up, I'm just a man like you. Get up, I'm just an angel. But this captain of the host of the Lord, this, this commander, this leader of the armies of the Lord simply receives the worship and responds to Joshua when he says, what saith the Lord unto his servant. He receives the worship. And we find that in the New Testament multiple times, Jesus signifying his deity in that when people bow down to worship him, he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't stop them. He receives worship readily. And that's another example of Christ showing that he indeed is God in the flesh. Joshua asks the Lord, what saith my Lord. And here's a burning bush moment for Joshua. He's experiencing now what Moses has probably told to him hundreds of times. There's a burning bush 
There's the captain of the hosts of the Lord standing before him, a messenger from God standing before him, preparing to battle for him and in his honor, right? Because Joshua says, are you for us? And he says, no. And look at the Old Testament promises. It doesn't say Joshua is going to fight. It says, I will fight for you. And that's why the captain of the Lord of hosts was there. I'm going to fight for you. Are you with me? Are you following me? Are you in my shadow? Are you behind me? The Lord's response is, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua shows himself humble. Joshua shows himself to be the right leader of these people in that time and time again he's corrected past mistakes, hasn't he? He's done what God commanded him. He's crossed the river, made memorials as he was commanded, circumcised the people, kept the, com- the, the Passover. Now he's basically showing, I am fully with you, O captain of the hosts of the Lord, and that he bows his face, worships him at this time, and then asks him, whatever you say, I will do. Where are you leading? I will follow. And the captain's response is, come and stand on holy ground. This is your position, rightfully so, and earned. This is your task that is before you. You've brought the people up to this point. Now get ready for me to do a great work. <laughs> That's what you see here. I love this. Because basically Joshua's done all the right things to this point. He even led the priest to go and stand and see the salvation of God. And he saw that through, instructed the people, and now his opportunity is here. He goes to the captain of the host of the Lord and says, what will you have me do? He says, take the shoes off your feet. Stay a while on holy ground. The place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua again, in true fashion, these four words you see time and time again, and it's a great image of Joshua's character. And Joshua did so. Joshua did so exactly what he was commanded to do. Let's his guard down, humbles himself and worships, puts shoes off his foot. In other words, just completely submitted to whatever God's about to do going forward. He's done all the right things to date. He's done all of the commands of God and even this one. He simply obeys and relinquishes his rightful authority to the captain of the host of the Lord. Are you for us? Are you for our adversaries? No, I'm for the Lord. And Joshua's like, yeah, me too. (laughs) I'll do whatever he wants. I'll go wherever he leads. I'm his servant. He takes off his shoes and stands there on holy ground. Thank you, Father, for this.